Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle, and I'm the production content director here at Purpose Church. Whether you've been a part of our online community for a long time or a first-time viewer, I'm so glad that you are here and have chosen to join us in worshiping our God today. There is something at our church for everyone, no matter what age and no matter what stage. So let us help you connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God by following our social media, checking out our website, and subscribing to our YouTube channel with the button in the corner. Today, we wrap up our study through the book of Ephesians and look at how the armor of God is what led Jesus to his triumphant entry on Palm Sunday. But before that, let me take a minute to tell you a little bit about what's happening at our church this Easter week. Easter is pretty much here, which means this week is our last chance to invite our friends and family to hear the good news of Jesus and get them connected to Purpose Church on Easter Sunday. One of the best ways to reach others online is to follow our Instagram at Purpose Pomona and find our online shareables. Easter is also a great time to get baptized. If you are interested in taking this important next step in your faith, we have a baptism class for you this Wednesday, March 27th at 7 p.m. in H100. This class will help you and anyone in your family, including children, prepare to be baptized on Easter Sunday. Speaking of preparation, we still need volunteers to welcome the thousands of people that will visit our campus on Easter, and we need you. Come help greet guests, serve donuts, lead children, and much more. You can serve individually, as a family, or with your friends. If you are on the fence about serving, why not just give it a try? God designed each and every one of us to serve, and what better time to start than Easter? To learn more about the baptism class, sign up for volunteer opportunities, and get the most up-to-date information about our Easter celebration, visit PurposeChurch.com Easter. See you next Sunday. This Friday, just before Easter, we will have a chance to contemplate the sacrifice Jesus made for each of us at our Good Friday service. Everyone is welcome, and nursery care is provided through age five. So let's gather together for this powerful evening, Friday, March 29th at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center, where we will reflect on the night Jesus laid down his life for us and worship our Lord through music, drama, message, and communion. There are many other ways you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to PurposeChurch.com give. Now let's pray together as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Palm Sunday that is the triumphant entry into your Resurrection Sunday on Easter. Lord, we're so thankful for this last series that we just did through Ephesians, and we pray that all the things that we've learned is now something that we can take out into the world and share your love. In your name, amen. The splendor of a king. Come on and sing it with me. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. Come on, purpose, we're singing as a family. How great! Lift your voice is our God. to Jesus. Sing with me. To the one who's given everything for you. Is our God. To the one who brought you into Don't this place. See how great to the one who's kept your family. To the one who has mighty God. plans for you. Oh, how great, how great. How great.
Let's sing it together, age to age. Age to age, he stands. And time is in. And time is in his head. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. Who is he? The Godhead free in one. Father, Spirit, Son. Jesus, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Don't see how great, how great is our God. We declare in the name of all so many things at us. Day in and day out, we are battered by forces we cannot see, schemes we cannot control. How can we stand firm amidst the suffering? How do we fight back against the pain? God showed us the way. He travels alongside us and stands in the fight with us. He doesn't remove us from the fire, but stays with us in the heat of it all. As we put on the full armor of God, we not only receive supernatural protection against external circumstances, we are eternally transformed from the inside out. Our Father prepares us to face our hurts head on with confidence. He carries us through every bit of pain. Through each aspect of our lives, God proves to us that He is immeasurably more. Great to see a Purpose Church happy first uh, Sunday of spring. Um, you know, this past Monday night, Kimberly and I, we like to watch uh, Easter movies, great Easter movies or Holy Week uh, mo series or that kind of thing to get into the spirit for the Easter season, to get ready for Easter and Good Friday and the, and the whole week. And so what we've been doing is watching The Chosen, and we've been catching up. We were behind in it, and so we were catching up episodes that we had not seen yet. And so when we're done, I was thinking I'd like to get some video clips from The Chosen. And so I'd need to tell our uh, media pastor, uh, Pete Wilson, and our producer, Tina Tong, I would need to uh, tell them where to find these. And so I'm in the dining room, Kimberly's in the kitchen, and I shout to her because I need to find out exactly where to tell them the scene was. I said, Kimberly, what season are we in? Meaning what season of the chosen? Kimberly, what season are we in? And she shouts from the kitchen, well, today is winter, 
but tomorrow is, is spring. <laughs> And when we realized how we had miscommunicated, we laughed for about five minutes. But I tell you, that's kind of a scary story. It's scary to think that my wife actually thought I may not know what season I was in. Is it summer? Is it fall? I don't have a clue. Now today we're going to finish up our series, Immeasurably More, a study in the verse-by-verse study of the book of Ephesians. And, And last week, Pastor Eric preached the best sermon on parenting that I have ever heard in my life from the first part of Ephesians chapter 6. And now we're going to finish up with verses 10 through 24. And the title for our study today is, Are We a Cruise Ship or a Battleship? Uh, Is our church meant to be a cruise ship or a battleship? Is the Christian life meant to be a cruise ship or a battleship? Do we see ourselves as being on a a cruise ship as followers of Christ or on a battleship? When we decide to follow Christ, we are immediately dropped into a spiritual war zone. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become Satan's enemy and you are in enemy territory. Uh, In the series on World War II called Band of Brothers, uh, I, I, I love this one line where Captain Winters, uh, the, the uh, guy that plays uh, Jimmy Fallon, the comedian, actually plays this guy in a Jeep, and he says, you know, I'm so sorry, but you guys, you guys are surrounded. And Captain Winters says, we're paratroopers. We're supposed to be surrounded. We're paratroopers. We're supposed to be for, uh, surrounded. And the same thing is true for us. We're followers of Christ. We're supposed to be surrounded. We're in enemy territory. We're supposed to be surrounded. Now, if you think you're on a cruise ship, when in actuality you're on a battleship, you're going to constantly be disappointed. But if you realize that you are on a battleship, you will be inspired to fight spiritual battles until you arrive in heaven, and that's when the cruise begins. This side of heaven We're on a battleship, but when we get to heaven, we will be on a cruise ship. Now that imagery of heaven as a cruise ship may not be perfect, but it sure beats sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp for eternity, doesn't it? Better than that, our church is not a cruise ship. Now we will try to do everything we can to, to meet your needs and the people of our church family's needs and the people of our community's needs. But that is not our ultimate purpose. Our main purpose is not to meet our needs, but our main purpose is to prepare you for spiritual battle. It's been said that the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of of its non-members. Usually you join something because membership has its privileges. But the Church of Jesus Christ is the only organization that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Now when people think that they are on a cruise ship, uh, they will say things like, I'm not getting fed, or the teaching is not deep, or my church is too seeker-sensitive, Or my needs are not getting met. And I've caught myself saying those exact same things many, many times. But when we realize that we're on a a battleship, we say things like, give me the tools to reach my friends for Christ. Or uh, church, my church, my church, give me opportunities to serve. Or I want to make an impact on my community. Or help me find my purpose so that I can make a difference in the world. And you know what happens when you say those kind of things? You know what happens? You end up making a difference in the world and your own needs end up getting met even more than if that had been your pursuit. And you have a deeper joy and a deeper happiness in your Christian walk. Now, this is why Palm Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays of the year. It is my job over the next 30 minutes as your pastor to get you fired up for the next 168 hours. For the next 30 or 40 minutes, my job as your pastor is to get you fired up 
for the next 168 hours. The next seven days are the most strategic days of the year. The eternal destinies of more people will be changed this week more than any other week of the year. This is the most important seven days of the year for fulfilling our ultimate purpose, which is to go to heaven and to take your oikos with you. Uh, oikos, the Greek word for household, the eight to 15 in your sphere of influence. The, the, the reason why God still has you here. Everything is gonna be better in heaven. You can do everything better in heaven. The reason why we're still here, why he hasn't taken us home yet. Why, why didn't he just, if worship's our main purpose, why not take us home right now? We'll worship better in heaven. If, if uh, knowledge is the most important thing, to gain knowledge of God and insights into God, if that's the most important thing, why does he take us to heaven? Because it's so much better. We learn so much better in heaven. Why does he still leave us here? Because we have not yet fulfilled our ultimate purpose, which is to go to heaven and to take your oikos, Greek word for household, eight to 15, in your sphere of influence, people you go to work with, people you school with, in your neighborhood, in, in your family, go to heaven, take your oikos with you. Like I said, you can do everything better in heaven. The music's gonna be better in heaven. You'll worship better in heaven. The preaching will be better in heaven. Does anybody want to say, praise God for that? Your knowledge and understanding will be better in heaven. Everything will be better except for one thing. In heaven, there will be no more opportunities to invite people to join you in heaven. That is why we make it our number one priority this side of heaven. I'm asking you to make a list of every person that you're gonna to invite to Good Friday service or to one of the three Easter Sunday morning services this week and pray for them and invite them. You know, I was, uh, last Sunday, I was at um, one of the churches that we helped to plant, uh, our junior high pastor, Jeff uh, Snodgrass, with his uh, uh, wife, uh, Julie. And uh, Julie sa said to their congregation, said, uh, there's a church plant called Unite in Pasadena. And uh, and Julie said to the congregation, you know, this is the one time of the year, if you invite people to an Easter service, they're more likely to say yes than any other time of the year. This is like our holiday. I mean, the, we don't compete with Santa Claus. Uh, Easter Bunny is not nearly the competition that Santa Claus is. This is still our holiday, Resurrection Day. And, and if you invite people, there's, there's a good chance they will say yes. And so invite them. Uh, Pastor Eric, um, uh, he tells this story. It's one of his favorite um, stories. You know, it's so annoying when a pastor just tells the same story over and over again. I'm just, I'm totally kidding. That's me, a hundred times. Uh, that's me. But one of his favorite stories he loves to tell uh, over and over again is D.L. Moody kept a list of 100 people in his pocket his entire life. And he prayed that they would come to Christ every single day. And when he died, 96 out of the 100 had come to Jesus. And at his, at his funeral, at D.L. Moody's funeral, there was an invitation given, and the final four came to Christ. And that's what we need to do. We need to have that list, and then we need to invite because we got a better shot of getting a yes this week than any other time of the year. How many more of these do we have before Jesus comes back? How many more of these do we have before we go to heaven? Uh, let's seize the moment. Uh, maybe next Sunday you want to take a stand for Jesus by being baptized on Easter Sunday. It's a great day to be baptized. You know, I was just in India. Uh, Pastor Eric and I were in India together with Pastor Sham. Uh, a few months ago. And in India, I heard that many people wait until Easter or Christmas Day to be baptized. Now, we only have a service on Christmas Day once every seven years. So this is your shot, Easter Sunday. Um, just uh, go to purposechurch.com slash baptism on our website or, or, or just come to the baptism class on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. here on campus or, or just show up next Sunday. 
uh, maybe you want to bring a change of clothes with you, or we will provide you with clothes if you don't have a change of clothes to be baptized in. Or just go home wet, get baptized in what you're in. Every person in the Bible went home wet. If you want to be baptized biblically, go home wet. <laughs> go home wet. And then finally, I just want to say that we need hundreds of volunteers to reach thousands of people on Easter. We need hundreds of volunteers to reach the thousands of people that will, will visit us on Easter. Uh, we still need, I talked to uh, Pastor Tomiko Chacon, and she told us that uh, we still need 55 more volunteers at each of our three Easter services. And, and so, would you just go I'm asking you, we, we need your help. We need hundreds of volunteers to reach thousands of, of, of people. As your pastor, I'm just asking you to go to purposechurch.com slash Easter, purposechurch.com slash Easter, and scroll down to the bottom of the page, and would you sign up, would you sign up to serve? Now, the invasion uh, into enemy territory was launched on, on Palm Sunday. The invasion was launched on the first Palm Sunday, Luke 9, verse 51, it says, as the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches for the trees and spread them on the road. Uh, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then verse 11, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, uh, the, the, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, it was kind of like a D-Day uh, when the Allied uh, troops first invaded Europe to take back territory from the Nazis under the regime of Adolf Hitler. Now, back in 1942, Winston Churchill had said about World War II, he says, now this is not the, now this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. But when the Allies invaded Europe on June 6, 1944, to take it back from Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, it was the beginning of the end. And when Jesus came into Jerusalem that first uh, Palm Sunday, and when he died on the cross on Good Friday, and rose from the grave on Easter Sunday, it was not the end, but it was the beginning of the end for Satan. Now God had foretold this to Satan at the very beginning. Genesis 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, meaning Jesus will crush Satan's head and Satan will strike his heel. Then Jesus meets his final test of obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane between 11 p.m. on Thursday night of Holy Week and 2 a.m. on Good Friday. Matthew 26, verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then on Good Friday, at three in the afternoon, Jesus dies on the cross. John writes in chapter 19, verse 30, he says, when he, Jesus, had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, at our Good Friday service, uh, this Friday, at 7 p.m., I'm going to preach about the time period between Jesus' death on Friday at 3 p.m. and his resurrection on, on Sunday morning at about 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. So then Jesus rises on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, it says in chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 1, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
and the battle begins. The battle begins. And this is where you and I come in. The five elements of a war zone from Ephesians chapter 6. First of all, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Verse 11. Uh, verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand, S-T-A-N-D, your stand against the devil's schemes. So number one is, is S of stand, S-T-A-N-D. Number one is S. What's the situation? John 12, verse 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world, Jesus said. Now the prince of this world, Satan, will be driven out. And he is being driven out by the followers of Christ, inch by inch, we're, we're taking spiritual territory. Now this battle began when Satan rebelled against God and was thrown out of heaven. Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, now how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You, Satan, have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And in the Garden of Eden, we joined as humanity, as represented by Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, we joined Satan's rebellion. My friend Tom Mercer said, we should have ruled. That is, in the Garden of Eden, we should have ruled, and he, Satan, should have died. That, that's what was supposed to happen. But when we joined, when we sinned and joined Satan's rebellion, instead, he's been ruling, Satan has been ruling this world, and we've been dying. We should have ruled, and he should have died. Instead, he's been ruling, and we've been dying. First John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then comes the final victory as talked about in Revelation chapter 19. I saw the heavens standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, linen white and, and, and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My goodness, this is a far cry from the sleepy baby in the manger, isn't it? Or even the suffering man on the cross. As Pastor Eric would say, this is not your hippie Jesus. This is not hippie Jesus. This is conquering victorious Jesus. This will be the end, but in the meantime, we fight on. Which leads us number two, S-T, a T is, is troops. That's us. Ephesians 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. 
Your spouse is not the enemy. Your parents are not the enemy. Your boss, your teachers, your coworkers are not the enemy. The person who's going to vote differently than you on November 5th is not the enemy. Satan is the enemy and his fellow fallen angels or demons, they are the enemy. But the good news is that there are God's angels there to help you in your battle. Uh, Luke adds a detail to his account of the Garden of Gethsemane that Matthew did not in, in, include from what we read earlier from Matthew. It says in Luke 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, Jesus said, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then Luke adds this, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And they did it for Jesus. And they'll do it for you in your spiritual battle as well. There is an unseen war going on between good and bad angels. And we are part of this spiritual battle. Um, when I uh, was a young pastor, I was 24 years old, I was single, uh, pastoring a, a rural church in upstate New York, in Homer, New York, uh, about an hour or so from the Canadian border. And uh, uh, I, I was all by myself and, and just kind of starting out in this brand new situation. And one night, late on a Saturday night, I was finishing up my sermon in the church. And all of a sudden, as I'm sitting at my desk, I just sense the presence of Satan like I'd never felt it before. It was, he was right in the room. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, I said, do you want me to stand firm? St stick it out, stand here, stand firm? Or may I go home now? And he said, you can go home now. Run, Forrest, run. So I bolted out of there and went back to the, the parsonage where the pastor lived at that time next to the church. And, and I thought, oh, Glenn, you just your imagination got carried away. Uh, you know how it is, uh, you know, a, a church can be a spooky place at night, particularly an older one like, like that building. And, and so I thought, you know, it's just all in your mind until the next Sunday morning I went and opened up my office door. Everything had been locked. Nobody could have gotten in. It, it, it completely locked all the doors, walk in. And my office is trashed. Just books strewn all over my desk. Um, uh, shelves, big wooden shelves thrown across my desk. Now, you know, there's a natural explanation. Maybe the, just the, the, the things that the fasteners just happened to release. But how they would have fallen down, not out over the room. And, and I said, oh my goodness. Uh, it was just Satan trying to scare a young pastor, saying, don't mess with my territory. And yet God says in response, stand firm, stand firm. Uh, on the other side of things, the, the good angels. Uh, I spoke at a Christian school near Islamabad, Pakistan, about six months before 9-11. Uh, we were right in Osama bin Laden's backyard. And then nine months after 9-11, a group of terrorists attacked that same school where I, I'd been, kicked down the door like two feet from where I'd been sleeping. And they, they kicked down the doors and they attacked that school with machine guns. But even though some very heroic guards were killed in that attack, the students of that school, uh, children and, and young adults, teenagers, they were miraculously protected. And the students reported that while the attack was happening, they fled to the school's chapel. And throughout the attack, they heard angels singing in the rafters. There are angels singing in the rafters of your house as you do spiritual warfare. There are angels singing in the rafters of where you work, of your school. Uh, in, in the places in your life where it is most difficult to stand for Christ, there are angels singing in the rafters and strengthening you as they did with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hebrews 13, verse 2, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And then A, S-T-A, 
uh, stands for advantage. The advantage is still ours. Uh, chapter 6, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Verse, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Let's go back to verse, let's go back to verse 10 uh, one more time. You know, in the original Greek uh, that the Bible was originally written to in the New Testament, this be strong, this verb right here, was written in what's called the passive voice. So it literally means not be strong, but be made strong. Allow him to make you strong. Be made strong. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know what my favorite verse has been during this uh, chapter uh, of my life? It's Proverbs 30, verse one. I am weary, God, but I can prevail. I am weary, God, but I can be strong as you make me strong. I can prevail. Are you weary today? Are, are you weary in trying to do the right thing and serving God and pushing back spiritual territory in your family, at work, at your school, wherever you are? Are you trying to push back of the darkness with the light? Be strong. Allow him to make you strong. You are weary uh, the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. You're weary, but you can prevail. Be made strong as you take spiritual territory at work. Uh, be made strong as you take spiritual territory at school, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, around the world. This spiritual battle is going on around the world. My dad... Uh, during World War II was stationed in Burma. And here he is on the left, uh, right here, uh, hanging out with Buddha there and another soldier. Yeah, uh, and uh, he was a logger. He was a forester. And so he spent the, the whole war building what was called the Burma Road and, and basically logging and cutting down trees as you see him cutting down that giant tree there. Just spent the war uh, basically um, doing that. And he had a profound experience when he was in Burma because he, he used to tell me he could literally see the difference when you went from village to village where the missionaries had been, where the gospel had been presented and where it had not yet been presented. And he said the, it was stark contrast. It was just unbelievable. The difference between where the gospel had gone, where people had carried the gospel and where it had not yet gone. He said the contrast couldn't be more stark and made such an impression on him that he, he, he really had to make a decision when he was going to be a pastor, was he going to be um, a businessman. He felt God called him to be a businessman every bit as much as a pastor is called to be a pastor. He believed that God had called him to be a businessman. Eventually became president of a lumber company. He spent his life because of his, 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 what he encountered in Burma, spent his life either giving money to missions or raising money uh, for world missions. And he writes in his diary, I have his diary here from World War II, and here's what he wrote uh, about one night. He said, a group of us uh, soldiers went to the village near the number two sawmill in the evening. I was surprised to find the Kachins and many GIs gathered on the green around a fire and singing hymns. I was able to identify every one. They had songbooks and the familiar Christian hymns had been translated into the Kachin language by a Baptist missionary. The English titles were also listed, so I picked out several that I knew from memory and sang them while they joined in their language. It was a thrill for me. A nice young girl whose name was Lucy sang a Hawaiian love song in English. Even the little children knew the hymns from memory and sang them lustily. Everyone was very cheerful. Several mothers were there with small babies on their backs they stood with their backs to the fire so the baby would be warm. The Kachin seemed to enjoy the soldiers and we enjoyed them very much. This was New Year's Eve and they were gonna sing in the new year. We left about 9.30 p.m. 
It was a beautiful full moon, lit night, and I will, a moon lit night, and I will long remember the pleasant sound of their singing, Jesus, lover of my soul, and what can wash away my sins as we left them around the fire. The gospel going into our communities, the gospel going around the world and gaining spiritual territory as it, as it goes. And then and our need is in verse 13. Here's our need, and therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in, in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for our church family, for me, for you, for our church family. These next seven days leading up to, five days leading up to Good Friday and seven days leading up to Easter. I'm praying that whenever we speak, words will be given us so that we will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray, pray for us. Pray, pray, I'm praying for you. Pray for me, I'm praying for you. Uh, members of my church family, members of the Battleship Purpose Church, pray that we may declare it fearlessly as we should. And that leads to D, S-T-A-N-D. D is the defining moment. Ephesians 6, verse 13. You may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. There's that point when the battle is over and the smoke clears and there you are, standing still. Church, my name is Claire and I am your student ministries pastor. Thank you for being a part of our online community. I invite you to follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website so that you can stay connected to everything happening at Purpose Church. I hope to worship with you again soon.